Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We are here today with Deb Copagan, and I told her as soon as I, like, you know, hit the press play <laughs> on the Zoom that I was having a fangirl moment, and I'm serious about that on so many levels. So I want to welcome Deb to the podcast today. Hi. Nice to meet you, finally. Yeah, thank in you. Sort of internet friends for a while but <laughs> yeah in, not even in person uh, online <laughs> yeah yeah well you know I've had that happen with um people for a decade I mean thanks internet but it also makes things um it it's there's good and bad but um it's it's really good to to meet you in this format um before we get started I need to read through your fantastic things that you've been doing so you guys listen to all of this Deborah Copakin is the New York Times bestselling author of seven books, including Shutter Babe, The Red Book, Between Here and April, and Lady Parts. Let me just. <laughs> <laughs> Her most me- recent memoir of, this is so appropriate, Bodily Destruction and Resurrection During Marital Rupture. Um, a contributing writer at The Atlantic. She is also a writer on the Emmy Golden Globe nominated Netflix hit Emily in Paris a performer, an Emmy-winning uh, news producer and photojournalist. And her photographs have appeared in Time, Newsweek, The New York Times. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Financial Times, Observer, The Wall Street Journal, The Nation, Slate, O, Oprah Magazine, Airmail, and Paris Match, among others. And her column, When Cupid is a Prying Journalist, was adapted for the Modern Love streaming series. She's a writer, producer, CEO, and publisher of the Substack Lady Parts. Welcome, Deb. Nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I I want to. I have so many questions, and I just want to dive right in um, to your courageous story in your book, Lady Parts. It is courageous on so many levels, um, from my perspective as a human being, but also as a woman. Uh, as a mother, as a pelvic health uh, therapist who sees women gaslit every day in my clinical practice. Um, so just on, on, on multiple levels um, and, and, um, and as a partner, as a spouse. So I wanted to start with like my wheelhouse of conversation that I have all the time. Um, and that is with dysmenorrhea, PMDD, et cetera, like women struggling with cycles, like hardcore struggling, like with anemia, things that are overlooked every day. It's a problem that I actually had and I'm a pelvic PT, right? So if I'm a pelvic PT and this stuff is happening to me, then I just want to, from the get go, tell everyone, Hey, it, it's not your fault when you go through these issues and someone's not listening to you because you can be an expert in the field and still get gaslit. So tell me a little bit about that story. I mean, you went through a lot, but you were talking about, you know, bleeding heavily, a, a con- but, which is very common, very common, but not normal symptom that, you know, from my perspective is driven by things like estrogen dominance, but on that we can fix, but then it's also becomes a surgical issue, like with fibroids and other things. So tell me about your story. I, I want to mention the other thing too, about, you mentioned the Viagra study and eliminating pain. And, I, and that's just like a, a kick, you know, like a punch in the throat um, to women everywhere when studies like that aren't followed through with, because they'd say, you know, it's not a public health priority to, to, you know, address what, 100% of half the population actually experiences. So tell me a little bit about that. So I think we should start from the idea that my dysmenorrhea, I didn't understand as dysmenorrhea. I just thought it was my period, right? Because mm-hmm. I've had bad periods since before the internet. <laughs> and <laughs> it's not like I could sort of research it easily or or even understand that something was wrong with me. And in fact, I didn't understand that something was wrong with me until I got this hemoglobin reading of seven. So mm-hmm. my GP at a regular you know, annual physical took my blood and he got back the number seven and he's like, this can't be right. I'm going to have it redone. So he had his nurse recheck and then she came back and it was a seven. And he said, how are you even standing? Mm-hmm. 
I said, I'm so tired all the time, but I have three kids and I'm working and I'm writing. And I just thought that that was what life was. And then he started asking further questions. He's like, how are your periods? And I said, I mean, pretty heavy, I guess. And he's like, what does pretty heavy mean? I was like, well, I can't even use um, super tampons anymore. I'm using a diva cup and I'm entering it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I am um, avoiding it every half hour. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm creating an ounce of blood every half hour during my periods. And he's like, and how long do those periods last? I'm like, oh, you know, 10 days or so. And he's, he's like, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes is, why aren't we teaching girls yes. what is normal, not normal? Why aren't we teaching girls when they first get their periods to measure their blood flow, to understand what's normal? That actually a, a full period is supposed to be what, like one ounce over the course of seven days, not every half hour. So I was essentially hemorrhaging seriously and severely for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And especially after my third child was born, um, in 2006 and I had a really difficult pregnancy and I'm sure that those two are related like he tried to come out at 30 weeks they give me tributylene they kept him in I was on bed rest for six weeks he finally came out at 36 and a half weeks something like that but you know after he was born when I was 40 it just got worse and worse and worse and worse and again I just chalked it up to, well, I guess I'm middle-aged and I've had three kids and this is just what women put up with. And I remember my gynecologist, when she took the uterus out, she's like, it was enormous. I cannot believe you've been living with this. Yeah. And the relief I felt after that was intense. Like, I, you know, I kept thinking, oh, I don't want to get rid of my uterus. The uterus makes me a woman. Why would I want to do that? And then it took my friend Nora saying to me, you know, what do you need a uterus for? Uterus for? All it does is get sick and ill after you have your kids. Like, what do you get, <laughs> get rid of it? If your doctor says get rid of it, get rid of it. <laughs> and she was right. I mean, I, I can't believe I ever thought to myself, oh, I need this organ once it's yeah. done its duty. And yeah. I would urge anyone listening to this, if you have endometriosis or adenomyosis or any of the diseases of the uterus that, and, and you've had the kids you want to have, by all means, be gone. I think that's so important to hear. Um, there are so many women struggling with that, with the one in 10 of just women who have endometriosis, you know, right. one out of 10 women are walking around and the diagnosis can take in upwards of five plus years because of, of stories like yours where it wasn't, you know, um, endometriosis, but it was adenomyosis, which that is the treatment for it, you know, is a hysterectomy. And we have been, whether it's social, social, cultural conditioning to symbolize that as, you know, the status of femininity or whatever. And I think it's really important to hear that. That was actually the next thing I was going to ask you about. <laughs> was that was when Nora says in chapter two, she talks about the hysterectomy and not being so attached to its symbolism and many women facing this decision. I, that was my question was like, what would you tell them about? Was there a grief process or did you just feel immediately, you know, relief? Immediate relief and, and sort of angry at myself for not having understood what that relief would feel like and how that would affect all the other forces in my body. I mean, it was, it was so necessary. And I remember my doctor saying to me, look, we can keep your uterus in and then just hospitalize you for anemia every month, or you can get rid of your uterus. And I remember thinking, well, that's not even a choice. Like, of course, I'm going to have to get rid of the uterus, but thinking like, but I don't want to, you know, we get so caught up in the symbolism of who we are as women. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, you know, I, that I got that uterus out in 2012. It's now 2023. I don't miss it one day. <laughs> Not a single thing. <laughs> Only thing that I think it would have been useful to keep a uterus, I'll have to say, is to know when I went through menopause. Because I don't know when I went through menopause. And I do know that had I been on, had somebody told me to go on hormone, um, menopause hormone therapy, 
in my 40s, I might have avoided the osteoporosis I was just diagnosed with today. I just, I, was it? Not today, but I mean, this just, past yeah. two months, I don't remember. It was yeah. like, like two months ago, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. And I was like, I got on menopause therapy, hormone therapy, menopause hormone therapy, MHT. Um, I got on that um, in 2000. 20 2019 2020 I can't remember exactly when I want to it must have been 2019 so I given myself a good running start but I could have given myself like another decade of that and we know I mean from studies we know that going on more menopause hormone therapy as you're going through perimenopause Mm -hmm. will help prevent osteoporosis I didn't know that nobody told me Mm -hmm. now I have osteoporosis, full-blown, not even osteopenia, full-blown osteoporosis. And, you know, it took me months to even see a specialist. And I'm not seeing them until December. So I don't even know what's the pro- what the program is these days, except for I'm taking vitamin D and I'm taking calcium and I'm waiting to talk to a specialist because that's how healthcare in the United States works oh today. Goodness. Well. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that later. I have to deal with that all the time. Um, and that was probably, oh goodness, that was a good chunk of uh, the, the patient clinical care that I had to provide last week is women coming in, the same thing happened, they weren't told. It wasn't even a concern because they were using bad science from 20 years ago that oh. said, oh, you don't take HRT. And if you have a history of cancer, you don't t- take HRT. Well, actually, if you take it, it decreases your risk. Especially for somebody without a uterus. And nobody told yeah. me that either. And by the way, I was diagnosed. I don't even want to call it breast cancer. It wasn't breast cancer. It was called stage zero back then, breast mm-hmm. cancer, which these days they're not calling breast cancer. But I had a lump. It was, you know, it was in my breast. It's gone. Everything's fine. But nobody told me that when you lose your uterus, it's you, you you prevent breast cancer by going on menopause hormone therapy, which mm-hmm. used to be called HRT and now it's called MHT or whatever. I don't know what the terminology is, but I think that everybody's <laughs> calling it MHT these days. <laughs> yeah, there's there's BHRT, bioidentical, you know, hormone replacement therapy. The thing is, um, most practitioners, and I, I hate to say this, but I'm also 50 now and I'm just tired of mincing words that we can just say most practitioners are operating on old science and they're not actually informing women of what the new evidence-based care is. That's because they're not keeping up with it themselves. And so I see a lot of women who are not even being given the choice or the option to consider replacement therapy. And then things like this happen where osteopenia, osteoporosis, especially with either hysterectomy or ablation. Maybe they just had ablation and their uterus isn't working anymore. It's effectively, you know, um, DOA. You don't really know when you go through menopause either then because things abruptly stop. So it's basically surgical menopause and that makes things very confusing. So yeah, it makes me really angry. And um, you experiencing that is like, it's an understatement, you know, for me to say that. I went through a surgical menopause too as well. So um there's, there's a lot of things to be said for that experience, but for everyone listening, I just want you to know that if you're going through this experience, if, if you have heavy periods, endo, adenomyosis, a surgical menopause of any sort, which can also mean you're on birth control, that is a higher level conversation to have with your practitioner. And if they can't answer those questions, that's a good time to find a new practitioner. So I actually did so much research to find my current gynecologist and it took, I would say weeks of like pouring through the Google reviews, reading who was on my, on my healthcare plan, calling the practitioners themselves, interviewing them and saying, what do you think about hormone therapy? Yeah. Uh, I finally found Dr. Amazing Molly McBride here in New York. I've sent I would say over 50 people to her and they've all called me back saying, oh my God, finally somebody's listening because she stays up on the latest science. She's empathic. She meets with you for 20 minutes. She's incredible, but it took forever to find this person. I will say also though, I had an experience this weekend that I I took as hopeful, which is I had another UTI because I get them. And I was away um, 
with my partner and, you know, I had to go to a small town hospital to get a test and um, uh, it came back positive. And he immediately said, listen, I, I know, I don't know if anyone's told you this, but you really should be on vaginal estrogen. I was like, I got it. Yes, I am. But yeah. just the fact that a male practitioner <laughs> in a that. small town hospital was saying to me after the UTI, you must be on vaginal estrogen. I just thought, okay, the message is getting out. Yeah. The, the activist urologists on Twitter and, and Instagram are finally getting their message to the regular practitioners who, by the way, it's not their fault because they weren't taught this in med school, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, no, they weren't. And also, I would say that med school these these days is better too. My daughter is a third year med school student, and she said that she did have excellent um, studies on menopause, on hormone therapy, and all that. So I feel like this next generation of doctors coming up, these women who are in their twenties right now, and men, hopefully, will have a better arsenal of information, and also are part of the whole Gen Z tech generation. So they will stay abreast of these things and not just believe what some, you know, white dude wrote back in 2000. (laughs) That's right. So well said. That is so well said. And that is also a hopeful message too, but because for everything that's happening to our generation, we can hope that, you know, the next generation is not going to have to suffer through that because of your book, because of practitioners because of better research because we're finally being included in research which is another huge problem of not of us not even being considered even when there was a government mandate to include us uh, women in research still not happening so we have really a, a it's really important not to just include us but to disaggregate our data like it's not just that you want to include us in the studies you want studies on various substances to study how it works in women and how it works in men and disaggregate that data. Otherwise it's useless to us. Right. Yeah. We're not just, we're not small men. No. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Gosh, this, so I want, I want some, I hope you guys are feeling hopeful in hearing this information that there are practitioners out there that you do have to do your research. Um, you can always reach out into in the show notes to us to um, help direct you towards practitioners. That's that's our goal. You know, that's our passion is to help you find someone who's going to listen to your story. Because if a, if a practitioner truly deeply listens to your story, um, they will understand you know what your needs are. And if they don't, they will admit it. They will say, "Gosh, I think this person might be a better fit for you." Um, so yeah, it's a definite goal to to end this whole. Um, issue with medical gaslighting, especially around pelvic health issues that mostly end up, but men get it too. Men can get gaslighted over like post prostatectomy and things like that happening where they're like, oh, it's just, that's what happens after that surgery. You just leak. No, it's not. (laughs) Right. Right. So with pelvic health issues in general, I think you know, all genders can, can get medically, medically gaslit for the, but for the most part, it does unfortunately fall into the pelvis of a woman. Um, well, let's shift gears a little bit because, um, there's, there's another really big theme in your book at which also women can be gaslit over and that's relationally Mm -hmm. and in the workplace also, but this whole relational workplace thing gets tied together because, And here's the thing, I was going to talk about this last, but because it is so um, germane to what we're talking about, the fact that we have, and this will just, we'll just jump off from, from this piece of the conversation. Um, I'm a, a huge advocate for making sure we have policy that supports actual family friendly (laughs) uh, situations in the United States. And right now we don't, we are dead we are bottom of the barrel, dead last for maternal health outcomes, for both paternal and maternal um, support and policy. It's just terrible. So unfortunately, that's the truth. But the one thing that I think is particularly insane is that our health care is attached to our marriage and our jobs. And because we're just experiencing discrimination in the workplace as women and particularly more so as mothers, the fact that you have health care um, attached to a marriage and a job is just like an, it's a, a relational, social, cultural bomb. I do think that I stayed in my marriage for much longer than I should have for fear of losing my health care. 
And you're, you're not alone in that, I think. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. It's embarrassing to say that out loud, but it's also true. Um, when I was considering leaving my marriage, there was no Obamacare. There was no choice of getting health care outside the um, corporate structure. And so what I did when I got separated and then divorced was I took jobs that I didn't want simply for the health care. I basically had to put my career as a writer and thinker and producer of books and other things on hold um, until until I could get my kids through childhood with health insurance. Um, their dad had moved far away. And so I was, and he didn't have health insurance. So I was kind of in charge all of a sudden of everything. Um, but that can make you sick too, right? Yeah. Doing work that you don't want to be doing in an organization that treats you horribly. And I would say I had that on several occasions. So the first one, when I got this diagnosis of stage zero breast cancer, um, fired me for spending not enough time at the office and every one of my absences, nine in all, in three months, which I understand that's a lot of absence in three months, but they were all spent at Sloan Kettering. So it's like, there's nothing I could do. Mm -hmm. So to be fired from a healthcare company for taking care of my health, mm -hmm. just like, you know, you can laugh or you can cry, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, being sexually harassed out of another job, um, being, um, you know, uh, working at another company where you would get fired because they weren't doing so well, or they were changing tax or somebody new came in charge like the fact is none of us can rely on our jobs the way that our parents generation could and so you're constantly switching health insurance is constantly switching doctors as a result of that because this doctor covered by that plan not that plan i will say that i have been on the new york state health insurance it's not great and it's expensive but it's not like cobra expensive so my cobra just to give you an idea of what i was paying when i would lose these jobs was 24 2500 a month from of me and my kids so four these days for myself individually i was spending like 429 dollars a month which is now going up to 700 dollars a month next year so that's like almost double increase still beneath you know, the $2,400 a month that I was so unable to afford. Um, but I just feel like we have to burn the whole system down. It's not like this is such a like patchwork. It's like a pair of jeans and we're putting patches on it, but we need, <laughs> we need just health care, not just insurance companies making money off of us. When I lived in Paris, when I lived in France and I got sick or I needed a pill, I would go to the doctor and I would get my prescription and I'd be treated for my cold or my strep or whatever the heck I had when I was there. And I would walk away and I would stand at the counter and be ready to pay. And they're like, no, no, you don't pay. So we need a system like that. We need a system that, you know, the national, um, the NH, um, oh my God, I can't think of the word. The NHS. The NHS, sorry, mm -hmm. in, in, in England, you know, a friend of mine, an American got really sick in England several years ago and he went to the private hospital because that's, he's an American and he thought that's what you do. They nearly killed him at the private hospital. He was nearly dead. He was transferred immediately to an NHS facility because they thought he was dying. And within two days he was fine. So when we hear, oh, socialized medicine is terrible. It's not terrible. It's like, it's, it's actually works in the places where people have it. It works. Yes. You might wait for, um, for a specialist for a longer time than usual, but I'm like in apparently one of the best places to go to a doctor in New York city. And I need a specialist for my osteoporosis. And I was diagnosed this summer and I'm not getting an appointment for until six months later. I mean, okay. That's quite a wait also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I, in working and speaking, um, I've been able to lecture in different countries and, and, and speak at different conferences. So I stay with friends or if I'm there, I'm always there for healthcare. And so I am, you know, hanging out with my colleagues who work in that system. So that's been in England, 
in Ireland, in the Netherlands, in South Africa, et cetera. And I come away with a personal experience and story of what those healthcare providers function in and under and how they experience the system. So just to give you an example, um, I was speaking at a um, therapeutic yoga conference in Amsterdam a few years ago and was hanging out with a friend who was organizing it and she's a nurse and um, a single mom. And she was just telling me the stories of just obviously a not traumatic like oh when my when my child um runs a fever that the physician comes out at night you know mm-hmm. they don't go to the er they don't get an eight thousand dollar bill from the ed um you know because it's after hours care and because they pull in you know the wrong type of care specialized care um or keep them in a room and then charge them you know for that or charge them 50 bucks for a tylenol or whatever um, so I hear those stories, and also what stands out to me is the the lack of trauma that's been experienced inside the system. Like when their child is ill, it is not it's not the things that you had to go through and experience that you know are in your book. It's that it happened, and they got it the next day, and they went about their day sure. instead of what we have, which is bankruptcy, yeah. right? And living on the edge, and charging your credit card up, and taking out a uh, a second mortgage, you know, um, there's all kinds of devastating stories that we shouldn't live and die moment to moment based on whether or not we can afford to the healthcare that we need to access. That's why I started the book that, um, with the first chapter when I was bleeding out from vaginal cuff to hissens, which is a really serious, um, it's when the vagina comes undone after surgery. So mm-hmm. basically your innards, everything's falling out. So there's blood everywhere it's a massacre. It's a, it's, it's, it's like out of a bad horror movie. And my daughter who was 20 at the time found me wandering the apartment, bleeding everywhere, going to the refrigerator, putting giant chunks of myself that were coming out into the refrigerator. Cause I was like, Oh, I may might need to save these. And her saying, we have to get you to the hospital right now. And I said, Oh, but I can't afford an ambulance. Yeah. You know, when we have a fire in our home, we accept that it's okay to call the fireman to put out that fire. But when we have a fire in our body or something goes wrong, we don't call because we're afraid of that $4,000 bill, that $8,000 bill. We don't know because nobody tells us before we get in the ambulance. I mean, I had an interesting experience recently, which is that I was in a car accident um, and I had, you know, blood on my face and my broken hand and all this stuff. And I was thinking, oh, I don't want the ambulance to come but of course they had to come because I'm lying there and you know bleeding and worried 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 about the ambulance bill and it came and it was $2,700 and I just thought okay how am I going to pay this and then I remembered oh wait this should be covered by my car insurance and so I sent it off to Geico and they paid it and I was like why isn't health insurance that way why I mean Geico's a car company and they're paying that $2,700 bill because that's part of what I paid for when I paid my car insurance every year, which is much less, by the way, than my health insurance bill. And yet we pay so much money for our health insurance and we have nothing covered or, or like, you know, I have a $6,100 deductible in my current plan. And when I, you know, I went, deaf from COVID. So I have hearing aids and I needed another surgery. And I kind of like my first, the first time I went for surgery, I was with United Healthcare at the time. And it was three minutes before surgery was supposed to begin. I'm in the hospital. I'm in my gown. My doctor scrubbed in, I've got the line in my arm and he comes into the room almost in tears. And he's like, United just denied your surgery. And I had to leave. And then we had to do it without general anesthesia. And it was so fucking painful Mm -hmm. that he kind of had to stop in the middle of it. And I just had the resurgery done last or two weeks ago and under general anesthesia, because my new insurance covers it. And apparently after I wrote this like op-ed for the Daily Beast, many more insurances are covering it now a year later. But still, I had to go through that absurd in a hospital gown and being told by United Healthcare, who is the devil, by the way, and I don't care if I'm saying that online, 
United Healthcare turned down a surgery three minutes before it was supposed to begin. What kind of country are we living in when that can happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking of the stories. Uh, and it's, you know, shouting that out is, is what needs to happen. When a friend of mine, her husband needed a lung transplant, he was going to die without this lung transplant. He's a young man. This was over a decade ago, I believe. Denied. They denied him until she took to social media, until she shouted loud enough, until she made enough noise where they would actually give him the surgery that would save his life as a father of two young kids. Um, and so not unexpected. Yeah. Uh, of, of, it, it leaves me stuttering with anger, actually. And it's that kind of, you know, anger and rage that only, you know, that we actually have to talk about, you know, to, to see things changed. But it also brings me back to your original question, which is we stay in bad relationships because we're worried about losing our health insurance. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then then the the trauma of being in that bad relationship, I believe, causes bad health, mm-hmm. right? I do believe that living in stress every day in a bad relationship when you have these cortisol spikes constantly that's not good for the body and it cannot be doing good things for your insides and so you're in this bizarre cycle of like i can't leave the relationship i don't want to lose my health insurance and now i'm getting sick because i'm in this bad relationship and it felt at the time like there was no escape and it took like with anybody who leaves a, a um a toxic relationship it took a lot and it wasn't easy. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say, oh, it was easy and great. I'm glad I did it. I am glad I did it, but it's taken me 10 years to be able to say I'm in a really great place right now with a empathic partner who cares um, with a mostly healthy body, except for, you know, death from COVID, but you know. Oh my gosh. I'm so, so sad that that happened, but um well, but you, I, I mean, here, I, I hear the hearing aids. This is what they look like. Oh, wow. They're so incredibly small. And these are, And this is thanks to Elizabeth Warren, who mandated that um, hearing aids should be over the counter. And just to give you an idea of what was pre-Elizabeth Warren and, po- and post. So pre-Elizabeth Warren, when I first got diagnosed with deafness, um, the hearing aids uh, were $10,000 uncovered by insurance. And they weren't good. And they were had like this little thing behind the ear, which mm-hmm. if you're a woman with long hair and you do this, it's like a shock every time you do that because it's the receivers behind your ear. So I thought, well, I got to get something that goes in my ear. And I was finally able to go to like Costco and get them for a little bit less. But then after Elizabeth Warren signed this bill that said hearing aids could be, must be able to be sold over the counter, these were $2,400. Now that's expensive still, but it's not 10 grand mm-hmm. and you don't need a prescription for it. And you don't need to go get a very expensive hearing test. You can do it all through. So it's, I, I'm actually like, I really believe in this company. It's called Ergo, E-A-R-G-O. So anyone who has any sort of hearing issues, I would just go get a pair of teeny tiny hearing aids because guess what? When you don't take care of your hearing, you're at much higher risk of Alzheimer's. And the amount of, you know, the, the research, the statistics that you include in, in your book also, it just really helps to shine a, a spotlight to really elucidate how important it is to pay attention to the symptoms that you're having and to make sure that you can find a provider that's going to listen to you. Yeah. Um, so I, pr- I really appreciate that out of your book too. I didn't get to mention that, but I wanted to mention that. Um, one thing I'd like to go back to for just a minute sure. is you mentioned 10 years past mm-hmm. um, in your marriage and you mentioned telling no one about, I'm going to use a quote here, the dark corners of your marriage. Um, there's the shame of speaking the words out loud, but also the shame, self-blame and dissonance of believing myself to be a strong, capable woman who's simultaneously too weak, which we need to dispel that, right? Too weak to leave a dysfunctional marriage or to even admit that it's dysfunctional. So many women go through that. I mean, if the majority of women initiate divorce, over 70%, and even higher with college-educated women, 
we need to talk about that. Like that's got to change, right? And it happened to you. I think what happens in a, a marriage that is not working is that it's like the frog metaphor, right? You're like a frog in boiling water that you're getting more and more used to, you know, when you get in the water, it's fine. It's, you know, you're swimming around and then it just, the heat gets turned up and the heat gets turned up and suddenly you're a frog in boiling water, right? And there was, you know, I can tell you the moment that I knew my marriage was over, but it was pretty radical. And it was, and it sounds so silly, but this is what it finally took, which was we'd been on a family vacation to Greece. We'd exchanged, we'd exchanged homes. There was a thing called homeexchange.com that doesn't exist anymore. So we found this family to trade our home in Harlem for their home in Greece, which allowed us to have a family vacation in Greece. It was free for both of us. And the Greek guy was like a, you know, a, a professor of Harlem Renaissance and all this stuff. So he's excited to live in Harlem. We're excited to spend some time in Greece. Our flight went back through Paris and I have a bunch of friends in Paris from having lived there. So I decided I was going to like live, stay with my friend Marion for a few days, visit with her and have the kids with me. And my ex-husband flew home from there. And one day I was in the garden, the Jardin Luxembourg, the Luxembourg Gardens, and my kids were on the merry-go-round. And I called my then husband and I said, and I wanted to tell him, oh, the kids are on the merry-go-round. It's so cute. Remember when Jacob was little and now Leo's on there. And like, I just was calling to, you know, yeah. share. And he didn't answer. And then I called again and he didn't answer. And I just kept calling and calling and calling and calling. And he never answered. And I just thought, I'm alone in a foreign country, sending text messages, calling, and he's not responding all day. And when I finally did reach him, he says, well, what's a big deal? You know? And I said, well, what if it was a big deal? Yeah, not It's not a big deal, but what if it was? I'm alone with three kids in France. Mm -hmm. And... I remember I got a haircut that day and I just like, I had this need to like cut my hair and have a clean start. And I thought to myself, I've got to get out of this marriage. I just got, I have to get out of it. I know that doesn't sound so severe, but it was kind of like the, the tip of the iceberg where if you just can't get your partner to yeah. answer the phone yeah, on any given day, it just yeah. felt wrong. It's like the Cassandra syndrome like you're trying to explain something that sounds so minimal but it's like death by a thousand cuts and that's what mm -hmm. cassandra syndrome is when you try to explain to someone you know that moment in time where something happens um and you aren't believed you know um and and, and so when you say like we were talking about you know you don't even know that your relationship is dysfunctional mm -hmm. I think on one level I did. And on another level, I'm hopeful. And I kept thinking, well, he'll grow up. He'll mature. He'll become a better version of himself. And, and I kept that hope for 20 years. And I think at a certain point, you have to accept the reality of what you're living in and not hope for something better. Oh, that's a big, that's just deserves a moment for everyone to exhale and consider that because women are also socialized to accept a wide range of things, whether it's the, a lack of empathy or a lack of intimacy or a lack of connection, or just the fact that they're not doing what they should be doing. They have mm -hmm. eyes, they know someone's feeding and clothing and kids and buying the toothpaste and the stuff gets done they they can see that it's getting done but then there's no there may be no acknowledgement of that like there's there's especially me i mean i'm from the south right that is very pervasive in the south where women are just supposed to stand by your man like the song goes like no matter what happens um and that's not okay you know that's not okay and, but it's also cultural too, in terms of just not even just Southern woman versus Northern woman. It's just, I believed at the time, and I don't see it now this way, that divorce was a failure. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. When in fact, the failure was to not acknowledge the dysfunctional relationship and to not get out of a bad place. Now, I will say that having made that move, it has helped me since then. So I was, I, you know, after my marriage ended, I'd spent four years alone and then I was with a partner for four years. And I found out in the middle of that partnership that he was an addict um, cheating and lying about the cheating that when I, when I called him out on something that was really odd, he lied about it. And for me, it was so easy at that point to say goodbye. You know, what I learned from living in a toxic relationship for too long was you don't stay in it. You know, I tried to work it out with this new partner. Um, and I soon realized it would never work out. And there was just no, I mean, there was sadness that this new thing hadn't worked out, but there was no looking back. You know, it was like, goodbye, close that chapter, move on. And it also helped me when I was looking for a new partner or dating, you know, to know right away and yeah. really right away, okay, this will work. This is not going to work. This is not going to work. Yeah, and you have quite you know, an I'm, expert, I'm happier. Right? I would be, you know, I have found a wonderful man, a, a wonderful, empathic, incredible human being. But had I not... I was already okay with being alone because being alone was better than being in a toxic relationship. There was a, a, a diagram once, a, a cartoon. I don't know if I saw it on Twitter or social media, but it was like a staircase. And at the bottom of the staircase was a fighting partner, like two partners fighting. And on the middle step of the staircase was a person standing alone. And on the top of the staircase was a couple in love. You're better off on that second step alone than at the bottom step fighting with the partner. Fighting is no good for anyone. And I'm not talking about like tiny arguments that have to happen for a relationship to move forward. I'm talking about daily spikes of cortisol with somebody who's just not seeing you, not listening, not appreciating you, not loving you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because I see those cortisol curves mm -hmm. <laughs> and labs. And when, when people come in and they're struggling with the combination of things that makes your story so incredibly unique but also shared with so many other women. And mm -hmm. that's the overlap of having, you know, it's just like in your book, you know, all the lady parts, having all these issues happen with the lady parts that overlap with relational issues when you're not being seen, felt, heard, um, for whatever those reasons are, that is like telling our story. So, so many women's stories. And that's what's so powerful. Yeah, what's about interesting, what has been interesting to me is I thought of my story as very specific, right? But you don't write a memoir if you don't think that your specificity will lead to something more general and universal. And what I have found is that I receive, I would say at least five emails a week, if not more from strangers who find me on you know, uh, Instagram or through my website or wherever they happen to find me. And they're either like a, long, a short paragraph of you've told my story, thank you so much, or they're much longer and devastating because they're telling my story. They're basically telling my story back to me, but they're living it. And they ask for advice. And I always say to people that are like, reach out to me. I try to answer every letter. I don't get to all of them, but I try to answer every letter. And what I tell the people that are asking for advice is I said, you reached out to me. So in some way, you reached out to a stranger, you know the answer to your questions. You just wanted validation. And I'm going to say, I will validate whatever you are feeling, but it's up to you to make these decisions on your own. Yeah. Yeah. I think that by asking the question, um, you know, quite often, I, I think the encouragement is people kind of gutturally know that when something's wrong, like, yeah. If you feel like you're not being listened to at your healthcare provider's office, you're, you're right. Ah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it helps you. It's so important that you just said that, that just to tell someone that, um, that they're heard can sometimes be all it takes to push them over into the decision-making, you know, category of, Oh, I'm going to do this now, you know, because someone has lived. A, and and, and talk to friends, honestly, too. I mean, we're so afraid of, 
you know, dissing our husbands or partners or in front of others, but it comes a point where you actually do have to start speaking to others about this. And again, I remember a very specific example where my ex-husband got mad at me and he said, I'm not coming to this dinner because I'm mad at you for whatever reason it was. Oh, I remember what it is, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, just tell them I'm sick. And I was like, mm, I'm not lying for you anymore. And I got to the dinner and my friends were like, you know, where's your husband? And I told him the truth. I'm saying he got mad at me for X, Y, or Z, which was crazy. And so he decided he was not going to come. And that was incredibly liberating. And again, that was another moment where I was like, okay, I guess this is what I'm going to do from now on. I'm just going to tell the truth. Because when we lie for our partners, when we cover up for their bad behavior, we're aiding and abetting. Mm -hmm. We're we're keeping ourselves in that prison. Yeah. Yeah. We are saving our partner or whomever it is from natural consequences from occurring. You know, when you're trying to, whether it's get them to be more involved with their kids, if they're not involved with their kids, it's like, then you're constantly bailing someone out of natural consequences that. Yeah. And we have to yeah. take responsibility for our own role in the tango. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a cliche to say it takes two to tango, but it does. And I know that my passivity and my inability to speak truths out loud to others, I know so many reasons why I was at fault too. And mostly it had to do with just trying to keep the peace and trying to keep everything together and not rock the boat. And in some cases you have to rock that fucking boat. You have <laughs> to rock that boat. Yeah. Yeah. That is um, such a good um, way to, finish that conversation because I think um, from a physical standpoint, I spend a lot of time helping women regain their voice because a lot of times when they have pelvic floor issues, they lose their voice and vice versa. But on um, a spiritual, like psychological, emotional level, there's that reclaiming your power, you know, of finding your voice. And we're often taught, well, we always are taught as women and conditioned, oh, don't do that. Yeah, that's too aggressive. That's bitchy. That's controlling. That's whatever. It's like, it's like, no, that's, that's just my voice and my feelings. That's not controlling. That's not, you know. And one of the great advantages of using your voice is you might find common ground with other women and help them. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what it's been. It's been so incredibly, um, uh, what a gift to, to have you, you know, talking today with me on the podcast as a result. Um, I want to finish with one topic that I think that hits every woman, um, no matter if you've had any pelvic health issues or any, any other lady parts issues or relational issues. And that's a topic of mental health mm -hmm. because I think that women are frequently gaslit into saying, well, if you just weren't, whether they're gaslighting themselves or someone else is gaslighting them, if you just we're stronger. You wouldn't have that problem. If you just had done ABC, you wouldn't have postpartum depression. If you had just, maybe you should just get screening for postpartum depression, or maybe you should just get screening for this. When in fact, it's often a result of the conditions that we're living under, particularly in the United States, that's yeah. creating the mental health problem to begin with. Well, let's start from the obvious barrier to mental health, which is money. Mm hmm Again, let's go back to the example of the NHS or France. When you need mental health care in those other countries, you go get it. Maybe it'll take a while to find a practitioner, but you get it. And it's part of your health care. Here, we consider it separate. Here, most insurances won't cover it. And so, especially in a city like I live in, I'm in Brooklyn, um, mental health care these days is like minimum $300 an hour. You know, who can afford that, right? Who can afford $300 every week? Um, I did bankrupt myself doing it for a little while because I was going through such a tough time post um, separation that I just thought it's my mental health or my life, right? I mean, there was one point where I thought of throwing myself out a window and I thought, oh, I got to get help. I got three kids. I can't throw myself out the window. Like I've got to figure out how to get better. Um, I will say that, Barring the existence of affordable mental health care, which we don't have in this country, and which is why I think we're having a mental health crisis in this country right now. Mm -hmm. One thing women can do, and I know this sounds so reductive, but yoga. 
yoga <laughs> really I feel like saved my life after, for example, when my dad died and I was so depressed and I didn't want to be on antidepressants anymore. And my doctor very wisely said, wrote on a piece of paper on his um, prescription pad, the word yoga and handed it to me. And I was like, Oh, I don't want to do yoga. It's <laughs> I'm not that kind of person. You know? <laughs> and I bought, this is so great because I, I bought a Rodney Yee DVD. This, again, we're oh talking 2008. Oh, yeah. So I yeah. bought a Rodney Yee DVD because DVD, I was like, I'm not spending any money on this. And I played that DVD every day for 10 years. I saw Rodney Yee every morning for 10 years because I am a goody two shoes. And when my doctor prescribes something, I listen and I do it. <laughs> last weekend, literally last weekend, I was out in Sag Harbor with my partner and it turns out that's where Rodney Yee practices. <laughs> and I got to go to his yoga class. Oh, you got to see like, For me, it was like seeing the most exciting um, celebrity <laughs> ever. And I did, I walked up to him afterwards. I was like, you don't know this obviously, but after my dad died in 2008, I started playing your DVD every day. So I saw you every day for 10 years years and you saved my life. So barring inexpensive therapy, which we don't yet have in this country, I would urge anyone that's on a budget to get a, you know, you can get on Amazon, you can buy a, you know, Rodney E DVD. I think he's great. And just do that every day. That's true. It's, it's how I started to major in specialization in yoga um, was because I was treating people in chronic pain, mostly women with orthopedic and pelvic pain. And my regular training wasn't working. Mm -hmm. It was the yoga that I had studied that allowed me to do it. Ironically, I actually took trainings and had oh. lots of conversations with Rodney about the future of yoga and yoga therapy and that kind of thing. That was 20 years ago. Oh, wow. I, yeah. When I started and when you mentioned doing the D DVD, I was like, oh, that's about the time that I started that I met, you know, him for the first time. And, and, um, but uh, anyway, I would wholeheartedly support that because it's free, it's low cost. Um, and it teaches presence. I mean, that's what yoga really, it's good for your body. So that's already great, right? It's good for strengthening. It's good for women's bodies, but it also just teaches you to be present and in the moment. And, you know, the best time in yoga is of course, Shavasana at the end, where you're just lying there, you know, like a dead person and mm -hmm. contemplating your life. And it's just... You know, again, meditation, yoga, these are these are tools we have in our arsenal that aren't too expensive. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'll we'll include some link in the show notes. I have a lot of um, free things available for people who have therapeutic issues, whether it's pelvic pain, vocal pain, diaphragm issues, long COVIDs, all kinds of stuff that um, are just they're either free or very low cost available, but I'll, we'll put the free stuff in there because. And, that... and, and, and one more point, by the way, is that um, if you have a traumatic experience, you're trying to get over, I just did EMDR for the first time because I was in this car accident and I was having a hard time managing the image. It was kind of going through my head and going through my head. And um, I didn't want to go back. You know, I didn't want to spend $300 a week to like deal with this one issue. And I called a practitioner of EMDR. I told her my story and she goes, oh, I can fix you in three weeks. I was like, come on. She goes, I can fix you in three weeks. And she did. So EMDR is expensive. It's like $700 a session. But if you do three of those and you're done with your, your, your trauma, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge proponent for EMDR, you know, just like yoga. Um, EMDR is, you know, most therapists will start out with CBT or DBT or some other cognitive behavioral or dialectical behavioral um, therapy and EMD EMDR. Um, and there are other um, similar neurological approaches to the same types of therapy, but I'm a huge proponent for, of EMDR for, you know, so many women experience trauma inside the system of healthcare that you need EMDR to get over what you experienced inside the healthcare system, mm -hmm. plus all your relational stuff. So mm -hmm. it's just incredible for that. I was going to mention that. That's one of the things, and this is a great kind of finisher point too, because I was just watching your other video on YouTube and you're talking to an MD EMDR. Um, yeah, that was my doctor. Yeah, yeah a practitioner. Amazing. 
Yeah, that's an incredible approach. So if you don't know about it, that's another wonderful resource for you to check out. Um, okay. We could keep talking. We could absolutely do a part two because there's so much more um, in your, your book that I wanted to mention. And maybe we'll get to do that at some point. But um, I just want to, to emphasize you know, to the listener that what I pulled out of Lady Parts after reading it twice, I picked it up again and read it again, knowing your interview was coming up, is that we need to believe women in healthcare mm -hmm. when they come in and they say, I'm emptying my diva cup or I have this pain, it is real and we need to figure it out, not absolutely dismiss it. Um, particularly, you know, to be believed in the ER, but also in, or the ED and then, you know, in your practitioner's office. And the other thing is, you know, when you're, when you're struggling with relational issues and mental health issues, um, it, to, to stop the shame and the self blame that a lot of the conditions that we're suffering under are because of a lack of just policy that we don't have. It's a, it's a lack of valuing healthcare access for all. And that's not your fault, right? That is not your fault. That's why this podcast exists. It's why you're writing books and articles. Thank God for that. It's why these things exist, but we all have to I'm, keep speaking up and keep speaking um, loudly about it. But believing women and then stopping the self-blame and, and self-shame because we're suffering from a lack of common sense policy. Totally. Um, yeah. So those are my, my, my big takeaways. Um, thank you so much, Deb. Do you have any like final words of wisdom uh, for us? Believe your own body. Yes. Not just believe women, but like yeah. tune into your own body. You know what's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to take me days to, to realize I had a UTI. Now I can do it in like, a, you know, I know. And so I get to the doctor, you know, when there's just a few leukocytes in there and it's not... Mm -hmm not full blown yet. Um, but it, it saved me a lot of pain. Yeah. Yes. And missed, you know, work and, um, and all kinds of things. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, all right. One rapid fire question Sure. because you write so amazingly, so beautifully, um, and so uh, with such depth. So what books, what book are you currently reading? I know I'm guilty of trying to read like several books at one time. So what are you reading? I'm reading Uncultured by, oh my God, I'm now drawing a blank. She has a long last name. It's about a young woman who um, grew up in a cult. And how did I find my way to that book? I think it's just like on one of those Amazon, like you might like this. And so I'm reading that book. I'm listening to um, um, Naomi um, Klein. She has a book called Doppelganger. And it's about how she keeps getting mistaken from a, for Naomi Wolf. But it's fascinating. And she kind of goes into the history of doppelgangers and what it's like for her to have been mistaken for this woman. And then she comes to the sort of realization of how similar they are. And it is so, so good. And I would urge people to listen to it rather than read it because she reads it herself and it's great to hear it from her voice. I'm also listening to um, The Power Broker with my partner because I never read it. It's about Robert Moses and it's so long. So it's just like on our endless car rides, we will listen. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I started another book. I can't, <laughs> I'm, I'm often reading like four books at once, but I can't yes. remember. The <laughs> That's why I said books plural, because, um, I feel like those of us from this similar wavelength of experience in life are that's what I do. I have about four or five, you know, at the same time. And I just, just pick. Oh, basically. I know the other book I was reading. So the other book I was reading or have been reading is my partner, um, has a wife with early onset Alzheimer's. And so he has written a memoir of mm. caring for her. Oh, wow. And he just finished it. And it it's not out, obviously. It's really, really beautiful. He's um, he's written one book before. He's a lawyer, but this is a, his second book. His first book came out in 1999. So hopefully this book will come out next year, the year after, something like that. Awesome. That's fantastic. What, what an incredible experience. So I'm, I'm sure that um, there's so much wonderful research on actually lengthening telomeres of caregivers who are providing care for those with neurodegenerative diseases. 
and um, yes. med I, yeah. I, we have no I, I actually wrote an um, op-ed for the Daily Beast that's coming out I think next week um, about how we have literally nothing in place in terms of caretaking in the United mm -hmm. States for people yeah. with Alzheimer's and 80% um, of the um, those who have Alzheimer's are cared for by a family member gratis, right? Nobody's getting paid for this. Mm -hmm. And, and 70% of those people are women. Mm -hmm. So we're putting the onus of this tremendous caretaking job on the adult daughters of those with Alzheimer's. And that has to end too, because if we were again, living in another country, be it the Netherlands or Sweden or, you know, um, really any other place besides your France, there are dementia villages, there's affordable or free memory care. In the United States, what I was really surprised to learn is you, if you want to have free memory care for your spouse and you're above middle class, you have to divorce your partner. Mm -hmm that they can go on Medicaid. I mean, what other industrialized nation in the world that. must you divorce the person you promise to love and honor till death do you part just so that they can get the care they Dignified need? Dignified care. Yeah. It's a crime. It, it, it is definitely a crime. Um, from early childhood, from early life to end of life, that burden inordinately falls, um, you know, onto women, sometimes men, but it does a lot of, um, it is also like it's that burden of care is physically abusive to the person who cannot actually handle that and do that. Yes. Um, and that's where the DNA, the research on telomeres and DNA comes yeah. out of. So goodness gracious, it's another reason because the research really strongly supports <clears throat> even short bouts of mindfulness for that, for um, preserving your DNA and preventing the very disease that you're actually caretaking the person for. Um, in doing that. So just another little plug for picking up mindfulness if you're listening, but thank you so much. Thank you so much too. It's really great to finally meet you. Yeah. Same, same here. You are doing incredible work. You're a force and I just really appreciate you for what you're doing. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.